luckily for us, um, aviation, this is very aviation friendly. And there's a lot of companies here that have developed drones in the past and big drones, military drones. And that trickles down to the industrial aspect of it. Know before you fly, the do's and don'ts for drone operators in San Diego. Uh, when I signed on, I, I swore an oath to protect them and I'm here and we're here to do that. A changing of the guard for the San Miguel Fire District and the homecoming for firefighters. There's no more room in hell. The dead will walk here. A tribute to the man who did more than create an iconic movie monster, remembering filmmaker George Romero. KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Ebony Monet. Tonight at the state capitol, lawmakers are debating the fate of California's landmark cap and trade law. It's part of Governor Brown's plan to reduce greenhouse gas emission. emissions. Missions California may be doing even more to address climate change. As Ingrid Lobet of KPBS media partner iNewsource reports, another bill would mandate all of our electricity come from solar, wind and other clean sources. California is already transitioning to electricity that doesn't aggravate climate change, but State Senator Kevin DeLeon's bill, SB 100, would significantly speed that up to 100 percent, 28 years from now, in 2045. These changes would be considered bad for business in some other parts of the country, but DeLeon believes they're good for jobs here. There are now 10 times more jobs in the clean energy space in California than there are coal mining jobs in all of America. California's economy has been growing while pollution from generating electricity has been going down. More than 70 people lined up at a committee hearing last week to say they support the bill. Some important labor groups are backing it. They want to keep hiring apprentices and keep their people busy building solar and wind farms. Uh, we've already seen construction slowed on because major utilities have what they need to meet the 50 percent. The industry is ready, waiting. The workforce is ready and waiting. All we need is SB 100. Nuclear energy and large hydro dam projects are allowed under the bill. Opposition comes from some legislators representing hotter areas where air conditioning bills can be crushing. The governor has not said if he would sign the bill. For KPBS, I'm Ingrid Lobet with iNewsource, an independently funded nonprofit partner of KPBS. The U.S. Forest Service says starting today, the Cleveland National Forest will operate under elevated fire restrictions. They kick in every summer and include no smoking, welding, or use of explosives in the forest. Also, anything with a gas engine like a chainsaw or ATV must have a spark arrestor on the exhaust system. A spark from a vehicle exhaust was found to be the cause of last week's ginning fire in East County. Fire Chief Brian Rhodes says summer heat and dry vegetation make restrictions necessary. We finally have reached a threshold uh, where our live fuel moistures are starting to drop and getting to a condition where they will support fire. He also says while open fires in the forest are not allowed, you can still have a campfire at Mount Laguna Campground. Forestry officials ask visitors to be aware of wildfire conditions and to take the appropriate preventative measures. After the Jennings brush fire near Alpine last week, officials had to remind people about the rules when it comes to flying drones during emergencies. Fire officials say drones can sometimes get in the way of firefighting aircraft. KPBS reporter Claire Tregesser visited a local drone company to find out more about what you can and can't do when it comes to flying drones. They look like toys. But these racing drones belong to Action Drone USA, a San Diego-based company that makes applications for drones. One, two. Every week, employees come to a dirt field in Chula Vista to test out their products. It's one of the few places they're allowed to fly. 
we must follow and abide by the rules of the FAA. Daryl Anunciado is the CEO of Action Drones. For example, we can't fly near airports. Um, we can't fly at night uh, unless we have uh, permission to do it. Uh, also, we can't fly uh, beyond line of sight or above 400 feet. Those rules are pretty restrictive, especially in a place like San Diego, where there are multiple airports, military bases, and heliports at hospitals. Those rules apply to anyone using a drone for commercial profit, and Anunciado says they sometimes change. He's lobbying to change one in particular. For example, power line inspections. There's about 5.3 million power, um, uh, miles of power lines in the United States, and we can't be flying it um, without the policy of changing the beyond line of sight flying. Uh, the power lines in itself are just so long and vast. Uh, we need to use airplanes that are navigated through instruments. And he says, like with the wildfires, there are additional restrictions during certain circumstances. Or you can't fly above um, people. There's a lot of people that want to do uh, do urban work, but it's really difficult. I mean, there's rules that you just can't fly above people. And so how do you go about that? There are also lots of rules for drone hobbyists. Stay below 400 feet, keep drones in line of sight, no flying over groups of people or stadiums or sports events. In April, the San Diego City Council gave local authorities the ability to ticket people breaking the rules. Despite the restrictions, Anunciado says San Diego has a fairly drone-friendly culture. Luckily for us, um, aviation, this is very aviation-friendly. And there's a lot of companies here that have developed drones in the past, and big drones, military drones. And that trickles down to the industrial aspect of it. Um, so when what happened is, uh, because we have, we're so aircraft-centric as a city, it's not hard for us to develop something um, in the drone field. And that's just what Action Drone plans to do, as they believe the future is in flight, despite the rules. Claire Tregesser, KPBS News. The San Miguel Fire Rescue District is back under the local operation after being under Cal Fire for the last four years. The San Miguel District covers more than 100,000 people in several East County cities, along with unincorporated parts of El Cajon and La Mesa. KPBS's Matt Hoffman tells us how staff are dealing with the transition. Beginning last Wednesday, it's exclusively San Miguel, so that's why this has been changed out on every rig. For more than 25 years, the San Miguel Fire District was locally controlled. The last four and a half years, fire operations have been run by CAL FIRE. You basically had a changing of the guard. That all ended last week. At 8 o'clock on Wednesday, everybody that came to work that day had this patch on. Basically a San Miguel uniform and patch under local control. That's newly appointed Fire Chief Chris Brainerd. For years, Chief Brainerd worked for San Diego Fire Rescue before coming out of retirement for the San Miguel job. This is a career highlight for me with the esprit de corps, the professionalism, the enthusiasm, the dedication that these employees are showing is unparalleled. I've never seen anything like this in my entire career. When the district first came under Cal Fire, all the San Miguel firefighters were offered jobs, including Captain Tom Payton. <laughs> Payton had been working for the district for 15 years prior. He stayed on with Cal Fire for four years, but today, Payton works for the locally run fire district. Uh, it was a great feeling to, to be returning home. You know, uh, we had our department back. While under Cal Fire, logos were changed and fire trucks were renumbered. Today, the district has a brand new logo made by one of its own firefighters. You can see the, the, high, the outline of the old in, engine number. Captain Payton number. says he nearly broke down after hearing the district's old truck numbers announced during roll call. I lived most of my life in East County, and I'm committed to the people of this district. Uh, when I signed on, I, I swore an oath to protect them, and I'm here, and we're here to do that. Since taking over control, the San Miguel Fire District has been to several dozen fire and emergency calls. Chief Brainerd says the move away from Cal Fire is expected to save millions of dollars in the next few years. For KPBS News, I'm Matt Hoffman.
The San Diego City Council approved a plan today to turn a Super 8 motel on Palm Avenue in Nestor into transitional housing for people convicted of low-level crimes. The $11 million project faces opposition from the community. Some residents say the facility will hinder efforts to revitalize the neighborhood. Barring any delays, renovations on the motel are expected to begin in January. When doctors tell their overweight patients they may be heading towards diabetes and they need to change their diet, the conversation often stops there. But Cheryl Clark with KPBS media partner iNewsource says a new Medicare proposal may offer a solution. Last fall, Medicare said it wanted to pay up to $450 to hospital groups and organizations like the YMCA for each overweight person 65 and older with prediabetes who enrolls in classes and drops 9% of their weight. Weight loss can prevent progression to diabetes. Well, now Medicare wants to raise the stakes. It's proposing to increase the amount to $810. The program can last for three years for each participant. And Medicare says providers can offer such things as gym memberships and child care to get participants to stick with the program. Medicare hopes that preventing diabetes will avoid billions in medical costs. And if Medicare finalizes its policy in November, the program will start April 1st. For KPBS, I'm Cheryl Clark from iNewsource, an independently funded nonprofit partner of KPBS. A couple competitors looking to unseat San Diego Congressman Darrell Issa are gaining some support from individual donors. Orange County attorney Mike Levin has raised more than $600,000. Democrat Doug Applegate, who challenged Issa last fall, has raised just less than $400,000. Issa, who only narrowly kept his seat in the House last November, has raised about $20,000 more than Applegate. Another challenger, Paul Kerr, has not declared any fundraising donations. ISA still has the most cash on hand for the race ahead despite the fundraising fundraising haul from his challengers. California pet stores will face a big, a big change if a bill advanced today passes. The proposed legislation would require that all dogs, cats and rabbits sold in stores would come from shelters or rescue organizations, not breeders. I'm confident the shelters will work with all small business owners across California that have retail establishments that sell pets now. They'll change. The law will make them change. And I'm confident they'll work together to support our animals. Pet store owners gave an emotional plea telling lawmakers they will lose their businesses if the bill passes. They say they don't have the nonprofit status to deal with all the issues that come with shelter pets. They also say the legislation would deny consumers the right to choose. New research suggests that changes to speech may indicate someone is developing thinking problems. AP reporter Carrie Antelfinger has more on those verbal cues. The little boy's going to get hurt in about a second when he falls off the stool that he's standing on grabbing cookies from the cookie jar. 72-year-old Alan Sweet is describing an illustration. His words could give researchers insights into dementia. Well, I can't say I enjoy it, because I'd be lying, but um, I recognize that that is, uh, you know, these are scientific tests. University of Wisconsin researchers say for some people, subtle changes in everyday speech can be correlated with early mild cognitive impairment, which can be a precursor to Alzheimer's. The results of the study, the biggest yet of its kind, are being presented at the Alzheimer's Association International Conference in London this week. This is definitely important because it's the first step in um, seeing that we can f see change in speech very early on. Current drugs can't slow or reverse dementia. Doctors think treatment might need to start sooner to do any good, so there's a push to find early signs. We all use different techniques to speak, like fillers. We all use that occasionally. But in this case, what we're seeing is something more severe than what, what's typical. Here is audio from a 2013 visit, which has been altered by researchers to protect the participant's identity. The boy and the girl are sneaking cookies because the cookie jar is on the second shelf of the kitchen cupboard. This is the same participant two years later. Her kids um, 
are doing something they're not supposed to be doing, or at least the boy is, um, and he's about to fall and probably hurt himself, and she's missing it. Uh, um, her... Um, Arizona State University researchers discovered similar results comparing President Ronald Reagan's news conferences from 1981 to 1989. As time wore on, Reagan used fewer unique words and more nonspecific nouns and fillers. If we're talking about disarming the, uh, uh, I don't, I don't think that uh, he would gamble on believing. Uh, that, uh, that he shouldn't protect his own interests also. He was ultimately diagnosed with Alzheimer's five years later. Alan Sweet watched his father and then his mother suffer with forms of dementia before they died. My goal is simply to cure Alzheimer's, um, but to do what I can, where I can, when I can, to further the cause of Alzheimer's research. The mother is, I assume she's the mother, Using words to find clues on early signs of mental decline. Carrie Antelfinger, Associated Press. Now ready for boaters and water fans. A ramp boat launch ranch at Glorietta Bay. Today marked the end of a makeover for the ramp and dock replacement project in Coronado. The upgrades made the dock more accessible to people with disabilities. Coronado's Mayor Pro Tem says the improvements were needed. The facility before was indeed falling apart and in fact a little while before we started this project we had a boat catch fire next to this dock and several of the wooden parts of the dock were damaged by the fire. Um, the ADA elements of the project while they're required by the state are certainly something we want to do um, and in terms of activating the bay the Port of San Diego wants people in and around the water and we're happy to help provide folks a place to do that here in Coronado. Before the renovations, the Glorietta Bay boat launch ramp was in continuous operation for more than 40 years. The new dock will moor 34 boats to meet the current demand for wider and larger sizes. A warm and cloudy week ahead for San Diego. Jeff Cornish has more in tonight's forecast. Things are going to be changing a little bit here over the next few days as slightly higher amounts of moisture will begin to increase from east to west and that will lead to some spotty showers and even a few isolated thunderstorms in the mountains. Now we're not going to see this in San Diego most likely, but off to the east some of the mountains we'll see a little bit of a drink of water. We'll be dealing with near average temperatures and those uh, low clouds will return near the coast and then after uh, being around for a few hours in the morning they'll begin to pull away to the east. Most of this is just ground clutter. We're not seeing anything local, but if we pull the map out to the regional level, we are really looking a little more monsoon-like across the desert southwest. Look at that swirl of showers and thunderstorms migrating west uh, and uh, they're pushing south and west of Phoenix. We've had some flash flooding in some parts of Arizona in some cases over the weekend. As you probably have heard, it proved to be deadly. So that's a problem in the desert areas. And you can see uh, late this afternoon into the early evening, we're seeing more thunderstorms kind of blossom over the higher elevations not far from Flagstaff. So future cast will show you those clouds and uh, showers evolve here. And you'll notice uh, around tomorrow morning, we will see a little bit more cloud cover increase. So there will just be some high clouds. Showers should generally be restricted to the mountainous terrain uh, through Tuesday afternoon. Uh, but a few of these will knock on our door and some of those higher elevations to the east could see a brief shower or thunderstorm into Tuesday and Wednesday afternoons. Not much of a chance in the morning, but the increasing likelihood is uh, into the afternoon and evening. With the help of the morning and afternoon sunshine driving temperatures up, we get warmer near the ground and over some of those mountains a few storms will fire. Tonight we're on track for a low near 70, partly cloudy and kind of humid out there. Uh, low clouds will be with us near the coast. Spotty storms are possible tonight though, Mount Laguna and Borrego Springs. So that's a bit of a change for us compared to where we were a few weeks ago. And then tomorrow back up to 103 and there's a straight a thunderstorm maybe near Mount Laguna, 78 degrees there. For the coast, temperature is pretty consistent near 80, partly sunny, not bad at all. Some low clouds and afternoon sunshine. Clouds in the morning primarily. Inland areas, upper 80s, pretty toasty out there into the mountainous terrain. Here we have those spotty showers and thunderstorms. They'll become less likely into the weekend, though. And the desert's still hot, but not as hot as it had been. I'm Jeff Cornish for KPBS News. A filmmaker George A. Romero has died after a battle with lung cancer. He was 77. KPBS arts reporter Beth Accomando has his tribute. 
filmmaker George A. Romero will forever be remembered as the godfather of the modern zombie. He gave us the rules that continue to this day for many zombie films. The only way to kill them is to destroy the brain or remove the head. If you get bit by one, you become a zombie and then crave human flesh. The best explanation for them came in his 1978 film, Dawn of the Dead. When there's no more room in hell, the dead will walk here. But Romero did more than just create a movie monster. He suggested that zombies could be a blank canvas for social commentary and a way to explore what it means to be human. Edgar Wright's Shaun of the Dead got to the essence of the zombie's appeal. Look at the face. It's vacant with a hint of sadness. Romero's zombies were like a faded memory of what it's like to be human, which was what made them both compelling and terrifying. George Romero has died, but unlike so many of the characters he created, may he rest <laughs> in peace. Beth Accomando, KPBS News. Another Hollywood death over the weekend, Oscar win winner Martin Landau. He was recognized by the Academy for his portrayal of Bella Lugosi in Edwood in 1994, but had a long and varied acting career spanning several decades. He starred in the 1960s series Mission Impossible and played the villain in North by Northwest. He was 89 years old. The presence of clouds and shadows mean plants live in a constantly changing world of light. Researchers find plants can detect shadows. In tonight's SciTech report, producer Frank Graff shows us how they do it and capture sunlight. It's not easy being a plant. That's because your world is constantly changing in providing one of the most important things needed to survive sunlight. Watch this time-lapse video. Once the sun rises, clouds come by. Shadows move, sunlight flickers, the sun sets. It's clear sunlight isn't always there, and plants use sunlight as energy to make food. You can think of light as a nutrient, like, uh, like water. Plants need water. Plants need nutrients like potassium and nitrogen. We add fertilizer to our garden. <clears throat> they need carbon dioxide, and plants are competing for these things, and they're competing for light. Plants need three basic things to live. Water from the soil, carbon dioxide from the air, and energy from the sun. Plants combine those ingredients to make food in a process called photosynthesis. It all happens in the plant's cells. Plants capture sunlight using a compound called chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is found inside a structure called a chloroplast. Photosynthesis converts sunlight into chemical energy, which is used to make glucose, or sugar, along with oxygen. Plants use glucose to live and grow. They breathe out oxygen. Now, let's go back to our time lapse. It turns out a plant's light detection system is tied to the efficiency of photosynthesis. They need to know right now, is it sunny? Is it dark? Is this a shadow? Is this flickering light important to me? And so in that way, they are smart. So this is a, your typical plant growth chamber. Researchers at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill used a growth chamber to mimic the light changes a plant experiences throughout the day. That led to the discovery of a protein in the plant called RGS1. The protein detects changes in light and measures changes in glucose to control how efficiently photosynthesis works. It knows when uh, it, uh, something is a shadow and what is a flicker of a light or the end of the day. It, it kind of knows it. I'm using know in an in a anthropomorphic way because remember a plant is sessile which means it just can't get up and go. If the sun is too bright it can't go into the shade like we do. Uh, it has to stay where it's at, and uh, it has to become, let's say, inefficient at collecting the light, because if it were too efficient, it would literally burn up. And so what we're trying to do is to determine how a plant's going to change in response to a change in its environment. In short, when light changes, a plant needs to show restraint. If a brief shadow forms and the plant increases the efficiency of photosynthesis, when the sun comes out of the shadows quickly, the plant will burn up. The plant needs to determine, is this a shadow or the end of the day? 
it can all be plotted in an equation. And so we have a plant at some height. So the plant, this is a tiny plant. And we say, let's let the sun shine a lot of light on the plant. And then if the sun shines a lot of light on the plant, what we observe is a tall plant. So what we're going to do is write this all into equations. And so in our equation, we have our plant height at the beginning of our experiment. And then we add some light into our plant. And then we measure how that plant height is going to change. And then we can plot out the height of the plant as a function of time. So what does a plant consider to be a shadow? The study found any change in light that was longer than four minutes was determined to be more than a flicker of light and the efficiency of photosynthesis was increased. And my model showed that if that duration is very short, like shorter than four minutes, then the plant won't react at all. The sugar is the signal. You can think of, you know, we all think of sugars as something important for, for as a nutrient, right? But it's also a signal. It's also a signal. Just like a hormone is a signal, or light can be a signal, or, you know, sound is a signal. Sugar, the amount of sugar and how it changes in time is also a, a signal. That story comes to us from SciTech Now, which can be seen Sundays at 530 here on KPBS. Here's a look at what we're working on for tomorrow in the KPBS newsroom. On Morning Edition, taking his job title to heart, meet California's Poet Laureate on tour of the Golden State. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash Evening Edition. Thanks for joining us. Have a great night.